Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Urban Land Institute of Northwest Arkansas's Attainable Housing Series. This is part two, product solutions. I'm your host, Wes Craiglow, and I am the Northwest Arkansas coordinator for the Urban Land Institute. Let's begin with a few housekeeping notes. First, we are recording this presentation and we will make it available for viewing in the coming days through our website and social media channels. Next, we beg your grace in the unfortunate event of a mishap. If, for example, myself or another speaker drop off, we'll get restarted within just a few moments. Finally, we encourage audience members to keep your video feeds off and your screen in speaker mode. That will ensure you see the speaker only and guarantee you the most amount of screen real estate here for the presentation itself. Thanks. Before I introduce the guest speaker for today, please allow me to introduce you to a little bit more about the Urban Land Institute. ULI is the oldest and largest network of cross-disciplinary real estate and land use experts in the world. ULI is its members. Through our members' dedication to the mission and their shared expertise, the Institute has been able to set standards of excellence in development practice. Established in 1936, the Institute today represents the entire spectrum of the land use and development disciplines. The Institute has long been recognized as one of the most respected sources of objective information on urban planning, growth, development, thanks in large part to its members' knowledge, experience, and active involvement in the organization and their communities. ULI relies heavily on the experience of its members. It is through member involvement and information resources that ULI has been able to set standards of excellence and development practice. District councils deliver the ULI mission at the local level. We engage local members through developing various ULI priority programs, hosting educational forums, and convening special events. And that is the ideal segue to, uh, to introduce why we're here today. Like we discussed last week, housing affordability throughout the United States has once again become an increasing concern. That, that, that boils down or distills right down to us here in Northwest Arkansas region as well. But thankfully, evidence indicates that industry leaders are starting to respond with new products aimed at a growing and underserved market. Actions are coming from publicly held home builders, developers, developers of master planned communities, neighborhood based real estate investors, and a new breed of entrepreneurs from other industries. It is important that our ULI Northwest Arkansas audience understands these trends, challenges, and emerging approaches. They shed light on potential new business opportunities and suggest a path toward a better balanced housing supply in our region, a critical goal that supports families and keeps our region competitive in the broader economy. With that, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Adam Ducker is the Senior Managing Director and Director of Urban Real Estate and Public Strategies for RCL Co. Real Estate Advisors, a firm that for over 50 years has been the first call for real estate developers, investors, the public sector, and non-real estate organizations seeking strategic and tactical advice regarding property investment, planning, and development. Adam joined RCL Co. in the mid-1990s. He's a recognized expert in economic development, market and financial analyses, positioning, repositioning, and marketing of real estate assets, consumer research, and corporate strategy development. Adam directs the Urban Real Estate Advisory Group at RCL Co., which is distinguished by sophistication in forecasting housing, commercial, and hospitality demand in revitalizing cities and development corridors. He also has specialized expertise in understanding the interrelation and unique marketing and operating synergies of residential, hospitality, and retail environment in small urban locations. Following Adam's presentation, we will begin a brief question and answer period. At any time during this hour, you're welcome to send your questions via private chat to me using the chat function found at the bottom of your screen. I will do my best to relay as many of them as possible to Adam prior to the end of the event. Your questions will be shared anonymously, so don't be bashful. Please jump in, they make this better. And without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Adam Ducker. Thanks Wes, that's a nice introduction. I, I really appreciate it and a pleasure being with the group today. Um, I'm gonna to share my screen and I am in fact gonna do a little bit um, kind of maybe more presenting than, than, than discussion, which sort of tends to work a, a little bit you know, better in person. And um, I'll also say it's, uh, it's a shame not to be with the group in person. I mean, we, we often get called on to, to kind of spend time with with other district councils i live in washington dc and 
and uh, I kind of relish that opportunity and think that's one of the joys of of ULI. So next time in person, I hope. And uh, it's actually been a couple of years since I've been, I've been in Northwest Arkansas and I follow the, the kind of rapid evolution of the region from afar and uh, I look forward to kind of catching up. So as Wes said, I'm gonna do about 20 minutes of presenting, maybe 25 minutes of presenting, bring us up to, you know, s sort of like half past the hour and um, there'll be plenty of time for conversation and discussion as we go. I will also try to keep an eye on the chat. And so, um, you know, if people should feel free to kind of use that and put comments in and I'll do my best to um, kind of respond to them as we go. And with that, I'll take it away. This is uh, a presentation based on some national research that we've done on attainable housing. You know, the first question that you might be asking is, what's attainable housing, although I know that this is kind of the second in a series. And um, I'll be presenting some national data and also some local data and also sort of trying to frame the discussion at least a little bit in the context of, you know, where we find ourselves today. So kind of framing questions, if you will, for our discussion. You know, attainable housing, we are talking today about mostly for sale housing that is not subsidized by any form of government, meaning market forces alone, you know, allow for production of the housing, but that's generally affordable to middle-class Americans. Middle-class as defined by most sociologists as ranging between 80% and 160% of median income. So literally the middle third of the United States and kind of framing questions, you know, does do middle class Americans have the access to home ownership that they did a generation ago? And quite frankly, do they still want it? Um, I think I'll argue over the course of this morning that they do. Well, we don't take that as a article of faith. What I'll be presenting today to answer the question affirmatively is kind of the business case for serving this market audience. I think there's a social imperative perhaps to do it. And there may be kind of legacy benefits for people who think about attainable housing as either kind of a, a social good or, and actually we encourage communities to think about attainable and affordable housing as a source of economic competitiveness. I would argue that, you know, the quality of housing and the relative affordability compared to some of the high cost or you know, kind of so-called gateway markets is something that has made Northwest Arkansas and other regions like it competitive in a national, maybe even a global context of competing for jobs, corporate headquarters, kind of relocation. But today we're gonna to really talk about the business case, right? That this is something that for-profit developers and investors can and should do to make money. And there's no shame in that. And you know, the, 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 um, the, the proverbial juice is in this case, we believe worth the squeeze. You know, I'll talk a little bit and I kind of look forward in the questions to hearing from this group about maybe the barriers to do it. You know, the question we hear very often is, I'd like to do that, but you know, it's too hard and here are the things that are roadblocks to that. And it will be interesting to suss out if there are ways in which Northwest Arkansas is slightly different than the rest of the country. And I will be just commenting as we go, it's you know too soon to make overarching comments about how COVID-19 might change this, if at all, but I'll comment on that um, some as we go. So that's kind of where we are. And um, I will uh, jump into it. Yeah, I'm going to move the chat bar over here. Okay, great. So, you know, I think big picture framing discussion, you know, the United States over the last cycle, you know, did not do very much, if anything, to address the fundamental, like, challenges around affordability in for sale housing, right? Chart on the left showing median home price and household income diverging with a little 
kind of like mini correction in 2010, but the line's sort of diverging over the last decade and this data ends in 2018, but, but has not sort of changed dramatically since then. And, you know, largely attributable, we believe, um, you know, to a fundamental, like lower pace of production in home building, like of any type in the United States. And, uh, and you know, for sale and, and, and kind of lower density housing in particular. And, you know, I actually did just kind of a quick look yesterday at the sort of permitting activity in Northwest Arkansas. And I'm not 100% sure I got the exact geography similar to the way you describe it, but I think the pattern that you all have experienced is very, very similar to the national norms, which is, you know, I think, I believe regional permitting sort of topped out or kind of averaged over the 2000 or 2010 period at something like 6,000 permits a year. And over the last decade came back to only 4,000 permits or so a year. If anybody wants to kind of correct me or chime in on the chat, I'm open to it. But I think order of magnitude, that sort of describes both the national phenomenon as we've shown here and the regional dynamics of actually accelerating household growth, accelerating national migration to your part of the country, but a constrained picture of home building, which has not you know, made runaway prices, not caused like radical unaffordability, but slowly, subtly, year by year continues to degrade the middle class's access to high quality and again, particularly for sale housing. And this chart, you know, kind of describes what we're talking about, you know, in, in kind of one slide. And it's, it's a lot to process. So maybe let me spend a minute and um, kind of describe what's going on here, right? This chart benchmarks the volume of sales by price range. And again, this is looking at the United States, although we find the patterns are similar from place to place. So benchmarks the volume of sales in each of these price categories to 2003, 2006. So kind of before, you know, the absolute peak of 2007, 2008, and looks at what share of transactions that um, that that activity represents, you know, and the the line that you see sort of trailing off here to, you know, less than twenty percent and not picking up is under two hundred thousand, and and maybe that's kind of not unrealistic. I mean, you know, maybe that's just not going to be possible in America to deliver a home for sale much below two hundred thousand dollars, although. Some of your colleagues in Northwest Arkansas are doing that. We'll talk about that in the middle. But the kind of the glaring kind of mismatch and really the heart of middle class housing demand is this two hundred thousand to three hundred thousand um, dollar price category, which you know dropped off and is really rebounded to only about sixty percent of its prior levels. Right, so it's now fifteen years later. The country is. 15, 16, 17% larger in terms of total number of households. And that heart of the middle class is kind of only delivering housing at about 60% of its prior peak. You know, interestingly, you know, the luxury segments or at least the higher ranking segments have fully recovered, right? Back doing about 100% of their prior volume. So effectively what we've seen, if you're you know, thinking back to that you know, 600,000 in permits to 4,000 or 6,000 to 4,000. And that includes multifamily, I believe. So, you know, take maybe the, the, the two thirds of it that's for sale. You know, the upper price segments, you know, home builder activity at about previous levels, kind of middle market segments significantly constrained. And that kind of creates this dynamic that we just talked about of, um, of, of, of a housing market that's delivering at lower levels, and in particular, is you know delivering to levels that are um, you know just just not kind of consistent with where the depth of the market might be. So these simple charts sort of just look at the United States and Northwest Arkansas on the right, and again getting back to that definition of. Um, 
what does middle class mean in Northwest Arkansas, right? In your context, very much like the United States as a whole, we're talking about people who have annual incomes of $45,000 to $90,000 per year, right? So again, that's 80% to 160% or the middle third of the population. And just rough order of magnitude, that means people who can really afford to buy homes in that $200,000 to $300,000 range that we talked about before. And so again, this is the heart of the market. Um, uh, potentially, a third of all the households fall into this category. And, you know, if we kind of rely on, you know, if we kind of assume that probably below this, this third is not really available to for sale housing. It's just, you know, we're never really going to be able to deliver a lot of homes in the hundred thousands or below. And, you know, the upper segments are available and maybe as much as a third of demand might be for homes above, you know, a hundred, uh, 300,000 that, that this product segment, this 200 to $300,000 price range, might be as much as of a third of the demand for housing in, in Northwest Arkansas. And, you know, I think the anecdotal reports we hear is a place where there is some home building activity, but not a tremendous amount, which is kind of the question that we're here to grapple with a little bit. You know, and kind of, we should ask the question that like, you know, maybe the developers are not wrong, right? Maybe the home builders are, in fact, attuned to what's going on, you know, with wealth and income dynamics in the United States, right? And this kind of looks at, you know, median uh, or, or rather income levels by kind of quintile of the population. And it's true, right? The income growth has been much more modest in this, you know, middle, these middle quintiles, right? As opposed to the high end where the income growth has just been tremendous. And I suspect that you see that in Northwest Arkansas too, right? That there is a bigger population of really high income, this top 5% or top 25%. And they have a lot of discretionary income and they're willing to spend it on housing. And so, you know, maybe, maybe the development community or the home building community is not crazy to chase that customer. But again, it, it, just numerically, it can't be more than a third of the demand. And we you know one of the things that we observe in housing markets that might be particularly pressing today is the higher price segments are the most discretionary in terms of purchase activity, right? Meaning in a way they have the, 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 the phenomenon of demand declining, you know, most significantly when there's a, an interruption. And these more kind of middle income or middle priced, you know, this middle priced housing market can actually be a little bit more durable through a downturn, right? And it's too soon to tell, but we are hearing that anecdotal evidence um, in for sale housing markets around the United States over the last eight weeks, right? That the very high end of the market has shut down more as those customers either maybe did a lot of the moving up already in the last, you know, six, seven years, or simply there's just not an imperative to move today, right? It's a discretionary move. Whereas these kind of more middle income segments, th this is actually shelter, right? These are actually people kind of moving towards, um, you know, from rental to ownership or from something very small to something with a little bit more space. So, there's some argument that, you know, as we kind of work our way through this pandemic induced financial contraction, we may actually find that the demand in this segment is, is actually more stable rather than less. I'll also sort of take a minute and just kind of think out loud about, or at least share our firm's view of what, you know, the COVID-19 impacts might be on housing in general and you know, I don't think anybody's going to be a, a, a favorable economic recipient of, of this condition. 
But I think our view is housing does derive some benefit from this period of, of, of being confined to our homes or at least more heavily based in our homes. The sense of the importance of home as a nesting experience, the sense of a little bit more space, a little bit of, of um, you know, security and comfort is money well spent, you know, and over the years, people in the housing industry have used the term flight to quality. And one of the terms that people are using in the last few weeks is flight to safety, meaning people looking at homes and their investment in their homes as an investment in their family's personal safety. And so this is not to say that housing will be immune from, um, you know, COVID-19 and the economic impacts, but that this impetus to, you know, invest in home, to have a comfortable home, perhaps to move from, you know, a smaller home to a bigger home or a more modern home or a more amenitized community, that kind of social imperative may be somewhat pervasive through this period of time. I'm gonna speed up a little bit. I talked a little bit about permitting activity in Northwest Arkansas. And I wanna sort of introduce one less demographic, one more demographic argument before we kind of begin looking at some sort of typologies and solutions, which is um, what we see might be kind of tailwinds to this attainable housing segment or kind of affordably positioned, you know, low density for sale housing. And that is demonstrated here, which is the baby boom, I'm sorry, the millennials, the, the children of the baby boomers, kind of moving into their kind of 30s and early 40s, kind of the classic years of household formation, right? And so what what the dark blue line or or or, or shaded area here shows is the distribution of households by age today and the lighter line in the back sort of looking 10 years down the road and um, where we see this shaded area kind of above the the line is you know the net change in the number of people in their 30s and 40s and this dark line shows the percentage of families or, or households with children living at home. You know, so one one myth to sort of like dispel at the moment is, you know, you you sometimes the popular press presents this case that millennials aren't forming households or having children or settling down in a conventional way. And you know the reality is that even in by the mid 30s, households today have children at a rate of about 70%. I think it actually peaks at about 72% which is not radically different than the last two generations behind them. So over the next 10 years, you know, demographics tell us that we expect to see a surge in the number of households in their 30s and 40s, many of whom we're arguing here will be kind of candidates for um, attainably priced for sale housing. So again, a strong business case for it. And then the other, you know, the other kind of big surge, if you will, is kind of in the mature markets, you know, the 70s and 80s as people kind of, you know, live longer and just the baby boom, which is just a much greater number of people than the prior generation move into that age group. So, you know, we think that demographics present another tailwind that maybe suggests the business opportunity here is significant. Just one last piece of data. This is from some research Arcelco does, kind of looking at um, what potential buyers in master plan communities, you know, express as their kind of desired price range compared against, you know, actual sales. You can see those track pretty, pretty closely. And what the supply is in you know, the large MPCs across the United States and master plan communities are only a subset of the housing market overall. But, you know, here you see that fundamental kind of mismatch that I described earlier with, you know, very clearly about almost half, or as I said earlier, at least a third of the demand for product in this below $300,000 range and, and only 17 or 18% of the actual supply serving that. Whereas 
you know, a whopping 10% of the supply kind of targeted to the very high end, which, you know, is maybe a third to as much as 50% kind of higher than what the actual demand might be. Okay, so transitioning, that was sort of making the case for why there might be a market opportunity or even a business case for doing it. You know, what does the industry tell us? And we had the chance to do um, some survey work with ULI's Community Development Council members, so people in the community development and home building business, and you know, asked a simple question in the chart on the left. What share of the total demand for housing do you believe is in this attainable band now? We did define it sort of slightly differently when we did this research a couple of years ago, but nonetheless, you know, the industry tells us that they see a significant share of the demand, right? You know, the, the midpoint, if you will, thinks that again, it's somewhere between a quarter and a third of the market. When we ask the same group of people, how much of, um, how much of your production is in this attainable band, you know, only something like 20% say, you know, it's more than 10% of activity. So the, the, you know, the significant plurality, almost 40% saying, we don't do anything in this group. And then another 40% saying a very, very small percent, maybe five or 10%. So I think there's some industry acknowledgement that there's a mismatch between perception of opportunity and production, but you know, why? And this will come as a surprise to nobody. You know, people's sense that land pricing and availability, you know, this sort of shows kind of a, a ranking, if you will, of challenges to delivering attainable housing, land prices being a constraint. Finish level required being a constraint. We'll, we'll problematize that as we go, because maybe the right language is the home building communities perceived expectations around finish level. You know, I think there's some evidence that finish level expectations might be lower than we as a community of builders and developers make sense. You know, local government regulations, probably true to some degree, right? You know, impact fees and other costs are, are deployed proportionally to the, to the home, not proportionally to the price or the size. So there may be a disincentive there, nimbyism, you know, a sense that um, it's, it's just too hard to fight the battle for moderately priced housing in our communities. Lack of density, or maybe the right language here is perception of resistance to density. And you can sort of like read on down the list, right? So there's some interesting ones that we'll come back to. Cost of materials and cost of capital cost of materials and building efficiencies. Again, not high on the list, but, but potential kind of roadblocks to this that we'll kind of come back to at the end. So let's just sort of take a step back. You know, one of the things that we spend a lot of time thinking about is, you know, what really might it take to sort of generally facilitate the market refocusing on that? And, you know, one of the questions is who's, who's gonna do this, right? And we'll talk about some local examples in the meantime, but um, you know, who, who are the housing pioneers in America or in Northwest Arkansas um, specifically? And what's the sort of imperative to do it? You know, maybe not so much of a constraint in Northwest Arkansas, but you know, single family zoning in America is so inflexible it really gives people very, very limited um, ability to do kind of meaningfully denser or different things to actually sort of bring down the land prices, which is sort of described below that, you know, maybe there does need to be some way of controlling that. I talked a little bit earlier about kind of impact fees, right? And, you know, this is something that we're kind of encouraging municipalities to think about around in the country and maybe it's just too hard to give actual dollar relief on impact fees but maybe when and how they're paid is something that can be 
kind of changed and you know and the question in the discussion time at the end maybe it will be good to hear if there are other things that people perceive in northwest arkansas either in the regulatory environment or in the business environment that get in the way of doing this and another kind of framing question is you know why why so little kind of focus why why hasn't the home building community responded to this if it's such a great idea and i think there are some good reasons right one of them is why bother you know business is good you know most home builders are as are are, are busy maybe even as busy as they can be or ramping up at the pace they can ramp up kind of servicing that luxury market so you know, business is good, or at least it was good until a couple of months ago. And, you know, an interesting question, right? Sometimes economic interruptions kind of give rise towards innovation or behavior change. And maybe that will be the case, particularly if, you know, my earlier hypothesis around the attainable segment perhaps being a little bit more stable kind of pans out. The second is the, the, the kind of conventional thinking around millennials is so misleading. I mean, even in ULI, like we bear a responsibility for this. You know, this discussion of how urban millennials are and how much they love to rent and, you know, it, I think kind of to some degree, you know, we're the, this is news and we talk about it as news, but it kind of masks behavior that's somewhat more traditional. And I think the capital markets have bought that. And we have seen the capital markets very much refocus on income producing housing and, you know, kind of like take a much more, um, you know, cautious and constrained view towards forced housing in general, and not in fact processing the risk profile of more attainably priced housing as, as perhaps you know, favorable. You know, as we'll talk about in a minute, there's not very good market data. You know, we scrape together what we can, but there's no consumer research describing what this customer needs and um, what they're willing to accept. And I think that's sort of a, ba a gong we've been beating, but it doesn't really exist. You know, the home building itself has kind of gotten beaten up in the industry, you know, which we consider you know, kind of a noble profession, um, building people's kind of interest. And, and lastly, and we'll kind of come back to this, is there is kind of mixed messaging in the industry around whether the margins are comparable in the attainable segment to the luxury segments. For sure, the gross profits are lower because the price points are lower, but the industry needs to do some kind of revealing around this idea of you know, is there kind of comparable profitability, maybe not the same level of profits, but is there comparable profitability? So what I'm gonna do for a minute is just now speak to three or four strategies that, um, you know, we see developers thinking about to um, gravitate towards product that is just attainable by price point. And, you know, the obvious one is just simply building smaller homes. and these are some examples of around the country, right? And going back, you know, 50, 75 years, you know, a 1400 or 1800 square foot home in America would have been considered quite large, right? And a 12 to 1400 square foot home would have been considered, you know, a very generous average middle-class American family home. You know, and it's very interesting, uh, coming out of the last recession, if you remember, 2007, 2008, there was a lot of talk about, you know, the homes were going to get smaller and the lot sizes were going to get smaller. And this was going to be the way we responded to the great financial crisis is housing implications. And actually, over the last five years, you know, very large homes, 3,000 square feet and, and higher, kind of like rose to new levels in terms of capture, or said differently, the percentage of homes under 1,400 square feet kind of like shrunk to a tiny share of new for sale homes delivered in the United States, right? So, 
you know, again, this is all ties back to what we looked at earlier, the declining share of lower priced homes, but, but why, you know, again, th these are some examples of product that has found a very willing and eager market who said that's works for my family. You know, just we do understand that there are some home builders, I'll use a local example, and I don't have great insight into Riverwood Homes, but delivering product in this 1300, 1400 um, square foot range, um, hitting the very high hundred thousands and low 200 thousands, and, you know, delivering three bedrooms. And again, that three bedrooms is kind of a like, is a critical dynamic. A lot of this housing in America is family housing, whether it's a family on hand or a family to, to be had. Um, but, you know, very creative way to kind of like accommodate three bedrooms and some comfortable living space. Now, Wes, we talked about this a little bit kind of last week and, you know, people say, ah, yeah, the housing might be available, but it's not in locations that are as proximate to employment and, um, or not in locations that have as much urban amenities. And, you know, the dynamic that we see local communities kind of grappling with is what trade-offs do consumers have to make and what trade-offs are they willing to make, right? So some consumers are willing to accept a longer commute or less local amenities. And some consumers might be even to willing to accept a home kind of smaller than this. What the hope and expectation is, is that you know, not only do we have uh, homes available at an attainable price points in some places, but that you have homes at attainable price points, right? So homes in the 200,000s available in each kind of local sub community, it might be very different, right? And in, in a kind of like edge greenfield location, you might get lower density and more square footage, and you might have to trade density or, or, or home square footage for kind of a more kind of amenitized or employment concentrate uh, convenient location. But, you know, that's a trade off that we're kind of beginning to see, you know, builders kind of experiment with in different parts of the United States. Right, I don't like this term missing middle, because I think it's kind of applied very broadly, but it does describe kind of this phenomenon of middle density housing that is underbuilt in the United States, right? So townhomes and stacked flats and giving people a single family living experience, which might be as simply designed as a front door to the street or some sort of private outdoor space. It could be kind of vertically stacked in the image at the right, which is a two story flat above a two story flat it might just describe kind of some direct access parking, but you know, I think it's a subject for another time. There is a um, kind of growing body of evidence that there is a segment of middle income consumers that are open to this and might make this trade if delivered kind of in the right location at the right price. You know, this chart looks at the share of multifamily permitting that is for rent or for sale over the last, you know, several decades in the United States. And again, it's just shocking because it was so contrary to our perceived outlook in 2008-2009, right? The share of, um, of multifamily permits that are, are for sale has shrunk to a historic low, right? So we are moving away from density as a for sale housing community, which you know cuts against this kind of opportunity to serve middle income households. And you know, as we understand it in Northwest Arkansas, there's almost no for sale townhome or so-called missing middle development. Although we understand that um, there is some very high quality you know, rental townhome development, you know, and a challenge to the group. I think, you know, townhomes kind of became a dirty word in America in the 80s and 90s. And maybe in a community like Northwest Arkansas, where you can, you know, buy a very nice detached home 
for $200,000, although maybe it sort of pushes you kind of farther from work and farther from amenities. But, you know, I do hope that people in your community will experiment with product like this, where the consumer might trade an amenitized location for a slightly denser product like this. I think a very attractive product, the kind of product where, you know, people could imagine starting a family. Um, you know, the story of the decline of um, the townhome as a for sale product is kind of consistent across the United States with the exception of very, very high cost markets where it provides a price of entry. But, you know, I think there's some work to be done in terms of testing the consumer's like interest in this product. And I think the contention here is the customer for this, some of them, not all of them, but some of them might trade for this if they're trading for a different location and a different experience, whether that's some walkability or, or some sort of rubber And again, it's not to say that one is better or worse, right? A healthy housing market provides housing choice at each price point. And I think that's what we're kind of talking about. The work that needs to be done is proving out that there's an opportunity for this. And then, you know, one last kind of example, and then we'll kind of open it up for discussion is, you know, most of the kind of smaller, moderate price housing that exists in the United States, you know, aspires to a finish level that's really quite high, whether that's architecture or interior finishes. And, you know, there's no, um, there's no good evidence to suggest that this customer insists on it, right? In fact, when we ask customers, people kind of buying homes, this is RCL Consumer Research, what would you trade off for price? You know, smaller lot, top of mind, people will give up density, smaller home, but, you know, a meaningful share of the market says they would accept a lower quality finish level in exchange for affordability and you know the builders on the call are saying well that's all well and good but we just don't really save that much money by moving to a lower grade of appliances and that's true but we need to continue to dig into this and i think you're going to hear about this in in detail in um you know next week's webinar but just again one other example of you know partners for better building locally so sort of trying to grapple with this this very dynamic that I think will be the source of next week's webinar, like how do you balance quality and architecture and desire for something that sort of meets our community ideals with the desire to hit an attainable price point. And then the last thing I'll, um, I'll do before we kind of open it up for question is to kind of introduce one more idea, which is, you know, building technology also does possess the ability to kind of meaningfully begin to improve our ability to serve the attainable price segments. I'm not an expert in building technology. And I kind of acknowledge that we've been talking about, you know, the coming revolution in housing construction um, approach in which we'll be 3D printing new homes for, for 10 or 15 years. And the actual progress has been kind of slow and materializing it might happen. And so I'll pause there. I think I went a little bit into our question and answer time and just open it up for discussion or conversation or whatever you want to handle it, Wes. Thank you very much, uh, Adam. That was, that was a, a, I believe, a, a very meaningful presentation. Um, you helped us get reacquainted with some of those national and, and regional trends that we're facing. To answer your early question about building permits, we have seen about a 30% reduction of yeah. building permits yeah. since pre-recession era. I went back and checked some of the notes that uh, yeah. Mervyn Jeberaj shared with us. He's an a, a economist here in our region, yeah. Uh, yeah. focuses on housing challenges. And he the information he shared with us just last week uh, demonstrates exactly what you hypothesize there. It's about a 30% reduction. Um, so, and, and the, I'll, I'll, I'll compliment that by saying we, we are seeing less population growth than we saw uh, in that era. Um, just some mm. changes to the, to the broader economy here, still very rapidly growing. We're just not growing at quite the same rate. 
our bigger challenge right now in supply and demand is available lots here yeah. in Northwest Arkansas. We, we had entirely too many um, 10 or 15 years ago. And so when the recession hit, we ended up with a lot of fallow ground that went undeveloped. And I think that there's a lot of, um, there's, there's a lot of risk management going on right now with regards to subdividing. And what we're seeing is uh, we, we are now beginning to see a dearth of available lots, yeah. approved plats that, uh, that, that then can be mm -hmm. you know, built upon. So, so that's, that's kind of where we are right now, one of the big drivers of cost in terms of land back um, yeah. here in Northwest Arkansas. But, but nevertheless, that was great information. I really appreciate you covering some of those trends and definitely you know, kind of peeling back the curtain on, on some of the solutions that you're seeing emerge throughout the country. Let's jump in, take a couple of questions here, and, and I'll start with one. Let me get my chat back up, my apologies. It's about uh, per square foot. Adam, one of our audience members is curious your thoughts on the focus of, or the reliance on per square foot uh, by the appraisal community, and, yeah. and what you see is that as a, oh. do you see that as a driver of, I mean, simple math says that if I am getting paid per square foot, the more I build, the more square footage I provide to the market, the higher my, my net is uh, presumably on that house. I'm curious your thoughts on that. Well, it's a problem. And I think the, you know, the risk that things don't appraise, right, is, is real. I mean, again, what we hope to do is we want to de-risk this for builders. And the reality is that today, if you build a smaller home, you know, you have, it doesn't cost proportionately less per square foot to build it, it actually costs proportionately more. Mm -hmm. And you have the risk of getting beat up by the appraisers. And you have the risk of getting beat up by the customer, right? Who, you know, they have no reason to believe that the per square foot price of a smaller home should be higher than the per square foot of a larger home, right? I mean, what you'd really love is for the consumer to just move to a much more like almost like bedroom braced pricing paradigm where mm -hmm. yeah, three bedroom home costs X and you know, a larger three bedroom home costs more, but that, you know, I think the, the per square foot pricing has gotten, you know, has been a problem for, for sale home builders. Now, interestingly mm -hmm. enough, it's not been the same problem for apartment developer developers right in that case you know maybe it's because there's more inventory and people move around more but 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 you know what the apartment industry has shown is that that consumer has been willing to accept a smaller unit at the same price when the product is better right mm -hmm. so they're actually buying a higher price per square foot and that hasn't yet translated into for sale housing but you know the home builders and architects are smart people that's sure. the next leg of the stool, right? To begin to, to like communicate value to the customer in a way that doesn't sort of get so much to price per square foot. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, thank you. Another question, um, the evidence, you, you did a great job of establishing evidence mm -hmm. about, you know, there is some friction between supply and demand right now. Mm -hmm. um, and that's based on, on you know, empirical evidence, uh, say census data and the size of, of households against the size of a house that we're building, but also that uh, that survey, that anecdotal evidence from the surveys that you did that basically describes what the builders are building and what the consumers say they're willing to accept. Yeah. So there's, there's clearly some friction in here. So what are the, you know, we say there's there are a lot of reasons why the supply side, why the building community is not delivering a product at a level exactly commensurate to demand. Um, is it because, I guess the challenge of risk management on the supply side, are there things that can be done to, to help the building community, that supply side community manage the risk? Are there incentives that can help them take the risk? Is it, or is it just simply builders who say, that's all well and good, I recognize the opportunity in the market, it's just gonna be for another builder. Yeah. What are there, I guess the first question is, are there incentives to help them overcome the risk? And then do you, can you uh, hypothesize on, on what you see as some of the barriers to their entry? Yeah, 
Well, I think one of the barriers to entry and one of the incentives is just simply information, right? You know, I'm humble directs, you know, and I think this is probably reflects other people on the call, like, that's great. You know, somebody on a webinar said we could build smaller home and the customers will, will accept it, but there's not, there's not yet enough robust evidence for people to make, you know, that decision and kudos to ULI for trying to do it, but it needs to be a broader industry effort. Right. And then three other things that maybe sort of go towards incentives. They're not exactly incentives, but you know, land availability, is something that is in the control of, you know, not just private owners, right? Land banking, you know, land leasing, public land, there are kind of explorations with making, you know, very affordable land available. I introduced earlier the idea of maybe not revisiting impact costs, although I think communities should consider that too. <laughs> but just even structuring them or timing their kind of like assessment to make it sort of easier on the building community. Mm -hmm. You know, there are code and traffic kind of like mitigation requirements that are burdensome to builders, mm -hmm. right? You know, the kind of road widths and the kind of level of, you know, I hate to suggest we cut corners on public safety, right? But there are all kinds of things in our pattern of engineering and development that kind of drive up costs, maybe unnecessarily so. Mm -hmm. And so those are maybe a couple of areas in which around the margins we can kind of like nibble at mm -hmm. taking some of the financial pressure off the home builder. I like it. Thank you very much. And that's a great segue into future editions of the series. So like you mentioned, next week we'll, we'll be getting a virtual site tour of the Willow Bend project by the Partners for Better Housing. So we're really looking forward to that. They figured out um, through some of the same solutions you've presented here today, as well as some interesting capital stacks, how to pull it off. They're gonna be filling nine acres in the heart of South Fayetteville, which is some of the most expensive land act costs in our region right now. It's one of the hottest areas just south of our, uh, the, the heart of our college down here. Um, and they're, they're gonna be able to deliver to market homes that are for sale, newly constructed, and attainable to middle-class family buyers here. And so very excited to deliver that. Even following that though, Adam, I want to continue this series. I want you a lot to continue to lead on this topic. It'll probably transition to a quarterly series, but I definitely intend to dig in to the policy solutions. What, what role is policy playing on driving up the cost? And, and, and what policy changes might we look at at the municipal governing letter, level to, to better in, improve the chances of middle-class affordability here in Northwest Arkansas for, for generations to come. Um, let, me, let me transition here to, um, to uh, you heard me mention next week, uh, Willow Bend, please tune in. You can find information and register on next week's edition and the fourth and final edition in this series this month on our website at arkansasuli.org in addition to a host of other information. And you can keep up with us on a day-to-day -day basis through Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook. I definitely encourage everyone to come by and check us out there. Once again, Adam, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very informative, um, and I hope the audience gained a lot. To my audience, as always, I wouldn't be here without you guys. Thanks for tuning in, and, and keep up with us on social media. Reach out to me at any time. You can find me on any one of our digital channels, and, uh, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Adam, Perfect. all my best. Thanks again. We'll be in touch. A pleasure. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.